Hello, everyone. Welcome to part 34 in our series of libraries and recovery. Uh, this began as the question, what is a library if the building is closed, uh, which was a, kind of an obvious question that occurred when the pandemic was declared in, in late March. And so in response to that, we've been exploring different attributes, I guess you could say, or aspects of that question, uh, like internet access and digital services, physical materials and uh, social infrastructure have been kind of the four areas that we've used to frame and uh, develop a discussion uh, in related to the question. Uh, it, it's really interesting because it, it's an exist it becomes an existential question about what is a library in the first place. Is it the building? Is it the services? Where are those services delivered? And so we've, we've had uh, obviously 33 sessions already. We've had over 80 speakers. It's all uh, recorded on uh, giglibraries.net. Uh, it's recorded by IFLA, our, our co-host here, uh, our host and recording, IFLA, the Internet, International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. At the controls in the Netherlands is Steven Weiber, the head of uh, public policy for IFLA and a, a, a long standing colleague with uh, Gigabit Libraries. Our session sponsor today is the DC chapter, Washington DC chapter of the Internet Society. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Internet Society, they're an extremely important uh, entity. Uh, responsible for issuing uh, the .org domain. So if you have one of those, uh, it's, it's, it was granted to you by the uh, Internet Society. And so they're very active in uh, uh, assuring access to the open internet. <coughs> um, they have a special emphasis on community networks which is an interesting approach. A lot of places, of course, are unserved. We've talked about this. Uh, a lot of places are completely unserved or lightly served. And it's just because of the, the perception of the market value of those places to the providers, uh, whoever they may be, private, public, whomever. Uh, community networks takes an approach of uh, pulling the network out uh, from the from the core to a community and building those as the technology becomes simpler and closer to a DIY uh, kind of technology, more communities are are picking this stuff up and and uh, doing it for themselves. And and this is really an interesting uh, development. And the Internet Society has been a great a great supporter of this. Uh, today we have two outstanding speakers. Uh, one returning, Rebecca Ranallo, uh, from the Cuyahoga County uh, system, outstanding uh, library system, top recognized uh, system in the country, and Kathy Curzan, the president of Funds for Learning, who's going to talk to us about uh, E-rate and various parts of the universal service that, that we, many libraries depend upon. Uh, so this little background topic, we, I mean, the whole context for this series is, is the pandemic uh, and libraries in response, uh, or first it was libraries in reaction, and then libraries in response, and now we're libraries in recovery. So we're still responding to this thing. It's still very prevalent, it's growing. I mean, just incredible numbers. I'm going to spare you the graphs this time. Uh, but we are also trying to think ahead, you know, beyond in a post pandemic environment. It, it probably will not be a sudden a day when it's over. It's going to just fade into the environment and be prevalent, I think, or, or present for a very long time to come. The question, I guess, is uh, science. You know, can science save us on this? There are a bunch of issues related to that, to that question. Uh, and it's not the only crisis, as we've talked about this. 2020 was just a, a, a series, a cascade of crises, just one after another. Uh, this, you know, this is probably the biggest one is, is planetary warming and all the uh, intense weather events that have been triggered by the, the, the heating planet. Uh, how are we going to solve that? I mean, 
do we even agree that that's a really a problem? Well, most of us do, but many of us seem to not. Uh, we have the technology. This, this image, this stunning image, is the South Pole of Jupiter, you know, half a billion miles away. That you know, we've never seen this before because you know, all we all we have are telescopes that are looking out uh, from from Earth and and some recently uh, arriving satellites. This is the Juno craft. It's uh, orbiting around the planet and taking these stunning images. So incredible science and technology. This is an image of, uh, this is science fiction uh, of a, not too long ago, uh, kind of looks like Skynet from the Terminator. But in fact, this is the map of, uh, of the uh, SpaceX uh, uh, network of uh, low earth orbit satellites that are promising to deliver internet, you know, everywhere in the world at, at high speed at low latency, which has been the big problem with satellites. They're too far away for uh, rapid uh, relay of data, but these are closer. So we're going to see if this works. It looks like it might, but we don't know. Anyway, it's maybe, maybe science is, is not going to convince us much because it seems that the, the people are, have different belief systems that are uh, difficult to overcome. This one just is the most stunning thing I've, you know, come across. This is a breakdown of, of whether people believe humans and dinosaurs coexisted. And for me, for my money, I'm putting all these not sure, definitely, probably, and probably not in the same category of they missed that day at school. And that only 25% believe they definitely did not. I mean, really? I, I guess it's just, it's, it's just daunting. So 40% of results as, uh, ascribe to strictly creationist view that the world is only 10,000 years old. Okay. That's one thing that will, will our young bright minds come up and save us? Well, only two thirds of millennials believe that the earth is round. Come on, come on, millennials. <laughs> we, I, we thought we did a better job of that, of, of, of teaching you the basics. Anyway, uh, yet we're, this is a 60% is a, is a, a record high number uh, uh, supporting the humans cause of planetary heating. Uh, but yet only about half of Americans believe that, that scientists agree about that when in fact, almost all of them do. Another, another factor in perception about data. Um, this was actually used, uh, circulated as a proof that the moon landing was a fake, which of course it's simply a photograph of a, of a guy setting up a diorama uh, about the moon landing. You know, we, we're losing some critical thinking skills here. Sorry, this is the heaviest uh, uh, text slide, but I thought that, uh, she made such powerful points here that it's, science is not just facts, it's, it's, it's a basis for discovery. And that we're fighting against our, our intuitions, our natural inclinations about what's real, what seems real. And then our brain, you know, we're trying to overcome these, these uh, feelings that we have. And uh, she put it here, it's like we're all in high school. What really counts is, you know, do we belong to a group of people? Do they accept us? You know, whatever, whatever, that, whatever that entry fee is, most of us will pay it to belong. And, and of course the internet, which has been the, the key to this kind of radical thinking is that before people with, with conspiracy theories and, and really off the wall ideas, were mostly isolated. You know, they kind of stewed in their own juices at home and, you know, they, they kind of kept quiet because people would look at them funny when they spouted off these things in public. But thanks to the wonderful internet, people can find each other. Anybody with any kind of an interest in anything can find other people that have that same interest, no matter what it is. And so that's what's been happening. These, these uh, aggregations of people with, uh, with, we'll just say interesting beliefs are finding each other, reinforcing, feeding each other, uh, and and clutching deeper, ever deeper into these uh, these notions. So it does. It's not a natural thing. We have to really work to kind of overcome the, our natural tendencies. 
uh, and even democracy, of course, is in that category, which leads us to today or day before yesterday or last week. And this just stunning event, I, it can't go uncommented on because it's it absolutely is historic that such a thing could actually happen in the world's oldest living democracy, which maybe is surviving, but we it, the jury is still out. And uh, so this was this captures a lot of this, I think. Um, somebody changed his mind from reason, and you know it's not possible to. <laughs> smells like a trap. I couldn't sleep all night. You know? it, it gets down to trust. So who do you trust? Obviously, we've got a big difficulty with uh, uh, trust in science and experts. Uh, people seem to trust people they know, people that they like. And, and so that's a little too limited of a, of a group. We'll get into this. Uh, we're taking off next week. And then the week after, uh, January 29th, we're going to kick off a... a um, a series uh, or a thread, a discussion thread around libraries and AI. <clears throat> this is mm, this is a huge area, as I'm sure you're all aware. Uh, uh, you know, from uh, from big AI to smaller AIs, discrete AIs, all this kind of stuff. What's the impact on society, uh, on our behavior? How we're being uh, encouraged, manipulated, or marketed to, or educated online with these these powerful algorithms that are drawing immense uh, uh, patterns recognition from these huge fields of data, uh, individually and 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 groups. So we're going to get into this, and and is there a role for libraries? And this is this trust question is pointed to here. Uh, libraries are trusted. Do they perhaps have an opportunity to play a role in mediating and verifying uh, various kinds of data and, and data management? Uh, Where there's a paper, we'll we'll put the copy up. But if you haven't seen it, it was put out uh, over a year ago by the Urban uh, Libraries Council on this very topic, and uh, we will have the Miami Dade director on with us, David Lankus from US, uh, University of South Carolina will be back and Richard Witt, uh, the author of uh, glia.net will also be there. Uh, and this is a, a, a slide from glia's page, basically giving the flow here. <clears throat> so that goes to a lot of directions and there's a lot of questions around that. Um, we are going to encourage everyone as a as a setup for this uh, to try to watch the social dilemma. It really articulates this uh, very well. It's a documentary. It's on Netflix. Uh, I asked them about the availability of, of showing this and they said you can do that uh, one time for educational purposes if for Netflix original content. So We'll see how actually that means, uh, but if somebody has an actual uh, Netflix account, they could they could use that and show it in public. Now I don't I don't know if it's going to work on on streaming here because it's already a streaming thing, but it could work at each individual library. We're going to try to figure all that out. If anybody has ideas, let me know. Let's get to the program today, and we are going to uh, we're going to lead off with Kathy at uh, Funds for Learning. Uh, which is one of the leading entities uh, helping uh, libraries and schools, especially, which are, of course, prioritized under E-rate, uh, to navigate this really daunting world. It's, I, I don't know, Kathy, maybe you have the numbers of, uh, you know, how many libraries depend upon E-rate. They don't participate at the same level of schools, even proportionally. There's roughly nine to one or eight to one ratio of facilities of, of library buildings to school buildings, but the schools do a much better job of taking advantage of this. They're generally larger systems. They have co administrative capacity. They have uh, more technology on average than the uh, typical library system. So 
Uh, why is that is a question. And then what is the future of, of this program, uh, which is declining revenues? The hot topic of the day is uh, contribution formulas. Uh, funds for this come from you know, the phone bills, uh, the ordinary old phone bills that people still have and are still paying uh, for long distance services. So it's declining rapidly and the demand is going up. So we got these moving in different directions. And so there's an issue around that. So Kathy, we're gonna have you kick off and then we'll go to Rebecca, who is uh, uh, part of a large and sophisticated library system. And she'll talk to us about what, what this program has meant to them and other interesting uh, uses of technology and sources of support and funding from the community, which is kind of our theme today, our resources. We're looking at it, you know, severe budget crunch. The, the, the cities and counties are already under massive pressure to cut. And so that's, of course, rolls down on the libraries who need to be as creative and persuasive as possible. And so that's what we're hoping this will do is help uh, that persuasion. So I just wanted to close the opening here with this quote from Tom Wheeler, who was on uh, one of our speakers uh, uh, a few weeks ago. And he made this comment that the solution universal broadband is not patchwork, but it's basically to start over. Uh, I'm not sure, Kathy, that you would subscribe to that for E-rate, but we'll just use that as a point of departure for you to uh, uh, take this up and uh, take us away. And the floor is yours, Kathy Curzan, Funds for Learning. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you, Don. Um, can you hear me fine? I've got my screen shared. I appreciate that. Actually, you set me up well. So I'm going to focus on uh, providing data to you, in particular to library participants in the program. So you will see uh, some trends. Don mentioned a few of those. And I agree that the participation is, is not as high as what we see with uh, the schools participating. But we have seen a pretty steady incline. So I'm going to show you some of that information. And I'm, I look forward to hearing Rebecca talk about how she's utilized it with, with other funding available, because that's really the, the key to utilizing E-rate. If you participate in the program, you know and you're aware that it doesn't pay for everything. But if you can leverage it with other sources, it can be pretty valuable. E-rate really shouldn't drive the decision making, but it can certainly support the decision making that you're already making. So let's, let's kind of move through some of these slides here. What I've done here is I've broken it into two categories. So the category one services, which are internet access, telecommunication, and voice. Voice has now phased out of the program. And you, you mentioned that, Don. So it phased out um, in 2019. And each year, it phased down 20%. So you'll notice that this first line here has a little bit of a dec decline. This is actual library sites that were receiving E-rate dollars. So not necessarily systems, but sites, actual sites listed on application. So it's been fairly steady, um, even with that uh, drop in voice services. Then we have the, this graph down the bottom, which is category two. So category two services with the reform order, you mentioned uh, Chairman Wheeler and that last quote, Don, the FCC issued the reform order in 2014. So funding year, these are E-rate funding years. So funding year 2015 was the first year of the reform order. And this is when budgets were uh, allowed. So every applicant, library and school received a budget. And budgets started 2015. The first five years were a pilot project. So the first five years, 2015 through 2019, those, the category two budget funds on campus connectivity, so Wi-Fi, wireless access points, data switches, cabling, it was a funding source for that. This last year, funding year 2020, was a buffer year. So it was, it was a transition year. So it was, the initial program pilot was five years, and then they allowed this buffer, buffer year. And, uh, for libraries, I think that was a, a very good thing for, on the school side. A lot of schools had already utilized their budget. So it meant that they had to wait till this upcoming year to apply for additional category two. But what you see here is the count of sites that received, count of library sites that utilized um, category two budgets in each one of these E-rate funding years. Okay, I, 
And uh, this is E-rate support requested by libraries in millions. So again, you see a slight decline here. I attribute that to quite a few things, primarily the phase out of voice services. So you'll see um, it's been pretty steady. There's some other factors and I'll show you on these slides as well. First of all, connectivity speed. The need for speed has continued to increase. So bandwidth has gone up and cost has gone down. So that, that's a good thing. And I, I've got some uh, good data that supports how much that cost has gone down. So that's some of this decline here. In category two, you'll see a little dip here in 2018 and you, that 2020 year, this year that we are currently in, the funding years for E-rate always begin July 1. So, and it, they're, they're referred to as July 1, 2020, so funding. So we're still in that year right now. Um, and you see an, a sharp incline, and those were libraries that realized that budget was disappearing. We had this buffer year and they could come back, if they had budget remaining, they could come back and collect on it. And that, um, that uh, statistic there, I think, is, is a really encouraging one for library participation, seeing that utilization. Because this chart here is really focused on, on category one. So this is the median price per megabit. And this is where I mentioned that price has gone down. So if you look at funding year 2016, the median price was $4.63. If you look in 2020, the median price is 89 cents. That is a significant decrease in price. It doesn't happen all at once. Um, it doesn't happen all at once. So at the time that the reform order was rolled out, you've got a lot of libraries, you had schools that were in existing contracts. So the, the, as the contracts are bid out over time, so if they're in a three-year contract before they can have a change in price and speed, typically that contract has expired and they bid out a new contract. So this this takes a little bit of time, but it, I, again, I credit the E-rate program for the competitive um, procurement requirements because I think that helps drive down prices and that's really good for libraries and for schools that participate in the program to get the most competitive price that they can get. If you hear, you know, I mentioned it's an 81% decrease since 2016. Now this, um, this is average data line speed in gigabit. So you can see too, so if I go back, so 2016, um, you've got an increase in gigabit speed of about 107%. So I'll go back a slide, you get a decrease in cost of about 81%, and then you've got an increase in speed. So you go from about 1.8 gig up to about 3.75 gigabits, and this is the data speeds reported on E-rate applications for this, this funding year. That's significant. Um, okay, so I'm gonna step into category two trends. And this, Don, uh, you mentioned in, in the opening how libraries have not had as high a participation in the program as schools. And I agree, because um, you can see here about, uh, the count of sites that have utilized the category two budget since 2015 through 2020 is 5,861. The count of libraries that are in the E-rate system, so participate in the E-rate program in EPC under the Universal Service Administrative Company are 13,540 sites. So that'll give you an idea. 13,540 sites participate in the program or active in the system and yet 5,861 are the only ones that have utilized uh, category two funding. But that is an increase. And I've got a, I've got a fun little graph in here to show you. So this kind of gives you about 19% used about 24% of their budget. This group down here is really to be commended. So they, they've used 75% of the budget that was available in that first round. So we are now starting our, our, our filing applications for funding year 2021. So those are services that will start July 1, 2021, and goods can be purchased in that time period too. So we're filing application, all applicants, whether it's a library or a school, have a new budget that they can use over the next five years. Again, it's best to be really strategic with this. So you may want to, you really want to plan out your five years and again, utilize the funding if you are making these purchases, if you can leverage this funding at that time. Let me go to this one, okay. What, and this slide too will tell you, I'm gonna 
go back here in a second. This uh, that I, I talked about the category here, which was only about 7% of libraries that are participating in the program. So this 7% received 75% or more of their budget. On average, they received about 25,000 per library site location. So that 25,000, they were able to leverage really well. So it might've been access points. We support quite a few library systems and um, I saw some really impressive uh, things happen by utilizing those funding and being strategic. You, you can use it until the funds run out. So you can use it all in one year and wait again for a next budget cycle, or you may use it over, over a few years, depending on what the purchase needs are. Um, so you can see here, that's, that's the, again, the ones that utilize the most also benefited the most. However, you know, this next range here still got about 20,000 a site. So the funding for libraries is different than the funding for schools. So the funding for libraries is $4.50 on a square foot. So I'll, I'll give you a few um, ideas on that as we get towards the end of these slides. Okay, this is the, this is the fun here. If you don't typically see a graph like this, but I think it was important to put this in because it demonstrates the change in library participation. So if you'll look, the reform order, remember the reform order came out in 2014. So the first year of budgets, so budgets for category two was funding year 2015. You can see that libraries have always participated. They've always participated, but at a lower rate. And look at this incredibly sharp incline the first year of the budget cycle. And then it got went even higher that final year, which is the year we're in, which was really a buffer year. It's kind of a transition before the new buff, uh, budget cycle. That's a pretty impressive um, growth chart for libraries. And I think there's a lot of success in that in utilizing it. I'm really happy to see it. So a little bit of an unusual graph here, but I think it demonstrates that there has been a shift and the program's been around for a long time. So this shift really occurred in library participation. And Rebecca, probably you probably have more um, insight as to why maybe other maybe reductions in other funding sources or maybe just that it was a category two and it was more guaranteed and easier it was reliable the old priority two system was not as reliable depending on what your discount was so i think i think that could have had an impact definitely okay. Matthew. thank you rebecca um Okay, so this one here it, it is again category two. So 15.8% of libraries requested it the, the current year we're in. Um, that's remarkable, especially because we all know what, what 2020 was for us. So these applications were being filed by libraries um, you know, in, in February and March. And actually the filing window in 2020 got extended. So it got extended uh, till the end of April because of the pandemic. Uh, and yet libraries um, stepped up to the highest percent of participation that we've seen in the program. And it was fantastic. Those funds disappeared. So if they, if they hadn't been utilized this year, they were not gonna be, or requested, it, that budget was gone. So I think we'll see trends over the next five years as well. Did you have a question, Don? Sorry. Uh when, when did the FCC approve this uh, outside uh, access using category two to provide Wi-Fi access outside of the building? When, when, was, when did that happen? Before the filing deadline? Uh, you mean on, uh, on library campus? Yeah. Well, it's, it's always been on campus connectivity. So it's, so it was, it's never beyond the campus. Well, it's it's been building specific and then they made a point that that included the whole property whatever that yeah, is that, that's been pretty clear you know for a for a time and i don't remember i've got one of my colleagues online right now and i'm going to check chat i don't remember specifically where but there were there i don't know exactly what the right? funding year it was but they they allowed community access um on premises uh and i believe off the top of my head i'm thinking 2016 at that point oh okay um, and then they made this clarification in April or something like that of last year, right? As long as it was on campus, that's correct. And you know, you you did certainly saw libraries step up quickly, and put signs in their parking lot that you could. And, and that was, um, 
that was impressive and pleasing. And that was at a time when we were all so unaware, is this a week, two weeks, there's so much unknown. Uh, and the libraries, I think, were, were the first to say access in our parking lot. Yeah, it's still going on, it's still expanding, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so I'm, I'm really at the last of my data here. I'm gonna talk about 2021. So I think, I think what's encouraging to see is there are libraries that have done really well, almost 6,000 of them that did that first round of category two budget. They were successful. So that, you know, it, it's a little bit learning how to do the applications. That's why being strategic with it and planning, you, don't, you, you have five years to use this next round of budget. So if purchases are gonna be made for wireless access point, if you are building a new site or adding on, and since it's based on square footage, you definitely wanna get architecture plan. If you wait for um, tax reports, that's gonna be after the fact. So be thinking as you're making library plans, certainly facility plans, if there's any additions, changes to it, you want to have documentation to support that square footage. The other thing that we, we are aware of, and again, it is support library systems that have kiosks. So those kiosks, they might have connectivity. And if they have connectivity there, that is eligible. So you, you wanna make sure that you list those kiosks as locations, especially if they're not on your, on your uh, standard campus, they're typically somewhere else. So you wanna list that, you actually can measure the square footage of them. So if you're purchasing an access point or you're getting connectivity there, that's something to keep in mind as, as as you move forward, we're, we're seeing libraries really uh, be progressive and, and opportunities and what, what's available to the community and technology is certainly a big piece of that now. So keep that in mind as you look at the next five years, when's the best timing with anything, the, the earlier you plan, the better for filing an E-rate application. You still have time right now so the E-rate filing window for services and goods that'll be purchased July 21 is gonna end March 25th. Um, so the procurement window, the window open today. So as of today, you can file applications. You'll have until February 25th to file the procurement application, which is a form 470. So th there's still time if you think you might be making purchases next year. Again, I think really the key is being, being strategic, trying to plan as far in advance as you can. When do you have need? Do you have current Wi-Fi? Are you gonna be upgrading any of that? And so that you can utilize these dollars and maybe maybe couple them with other funding sources to, to really expand um, what you're trying to do. Uh, keep all those facilities in mind as you do it. Bookmobiles are, are you know have always been eligible. There are some you know, procurement requirements around that as well. Um, so I think it's really, it's really planning and knowing that so many libraries did so well. So 57% didn't participate, but 43% did, and that was a growing percent, which I think is is encouraging. Don, do you, do, are you have any questions or? No, none of them. I, just, I don't think we have enough time, but. Uh... Uh, you, you make some really important uh, points and, and super interesting uh, data on on the, the history of the participation here. Uh, Bob Boker is on. Uh, Bob is a leading uh, voice and expert on, on E-rate utilization, works with the uh, Office Technology uh, Policy at ALA, uh, has been a presenter on here, and, and Bob reminds us that one of the reasons for the discrepancy between schools and libraries participation is the filtering requirement that, that comes with all of this money and is somewhat contrary to the library principle of open, uh, open access and, uh, and unrestricted uh, expression. So I don't know if that's ever been sort of sussed out from reasons I think the more well-to-do systems in areas that are a little more prosperous may be able to take the higher road and others simply have to you know, deal with the limitations and their requirements on it. It'd be interesting to find out how powerful that is a motivator for not participating. But I also appreciate that these small library, independent libraries and small towns just do not have administrative capability to, to cope with fairly daunting applications. Kathy, what are you seeing in trends for 
smaller town and rural libraries to cope with you know the demands of an e-rate filing you know i have seen a, a increase in participation in particular just in libraries that we provide support to and and definitely in the rural areas that they and i i think it's just the need for any funding that's available um if you do complete the same application however there you know the the discount is set and it's based on the main library branch and where it's located, what school district it's in. So the libraries don't have to, to uh, mess with the administrative piece of the window in the system. So that's, that's the benefit of being a library system. So uh, uh, I love library applications because I can avoid that. It also means that we don't have a lot of control. We've got to take that discount that we get, but it really comes down to then just putting the detail uh, I think one of the challenges that I see for like is, is you know having tech, tech technology support technology um, you know a lot of school systems larger school systems always have technology departments tech directors and they're really driving this is a technology based program so it's driven from technology and it ends up being a compliance program which is audited much more accounting structure so that 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 puts libraries at a little bit of a disadvantage too. A smaller rural library, you know, it's you got to be the the librarian, you've got to be the technology person, you've got to be the funding person. It's a lot of hats to wear. Um, the smaller any system is that's applying, I think I think a big key, Don, though, is is being in the program. So if you're in the program and participating, it's getting familiar with it. Um, one of one of the things that I see that's favorable to libraries is it's not as high a turnover. So libraries, library personnel tend to be very dedicated and loyal. And that means any, anyone can, can learn that, can learn E-rate. And so I think it's a matter of getting in, maybe starting slowly. So if you haven't done category two, you should know the first year that you're gonna bite it off. It's gonna take some work and you're gonna have to be available. You have to respond to questions. Um, you know, you want to make sure that you do your procurement right. You want to work with vendors that are knowledgeable too. So that way you get some guidance. Once you've done it a year or two, I think you'll, you'll, um, I think you have an advantage just by, by the personnel that tend to work in library systems. Are we also seeing uh, uh, coalitions of libraries kind of state level? We are. We are. And, you know, in some systems, the library system is already receiving their internet access or it's paid for, so they're not filing for E-rate. Um, we are seeing some coalitions. We, I see work with some in, in um, Texas that they, you know, partner with other um, entities to file, uh, to file their E-rate application. So you go to library system, partner with some other um, schools. And th that's allowable as well. So yes, we are seeing that, certainly filing Good. And, and we noted that in some states like Georgia, the state library play, pays the undiscounted portion of the of the cost. So that's, you know, all the state agencies do things differently, but that's a really interesting one. Some have, you know, statewide networks themselves that's that connect the libraries like uh, Maine and Delaware. Uh, so it's there, there's no absolutely on no, Arkansas they file on behalf of the libraries too so there's quite a few and that that's really helpful too um, and there's just there's also some large library systems that provide um, some basic procurement services mm -hmm. so that way it makes it very even though the libraries might be filing individually and like in New Jersey they the procurement piece is done it makes it a little bit easier for them um, I see that in the chat at there's reference at state rate coordinators. Certainly, yep. they're available to answer questions. Bob Boker is fantastic. Uh, so you want to reach out if you're having questions as you're filing, um, and it really just staying educated and kind of informed. You know, USEC has a lot of training videos on their site. It's yep. they're they're in digestible, uh, you know, planning 470, 471 because it's it's a lot to take in at one time, but it's certainly manageable. Bit by bit, with with uh, others, you know, kind of reinforced like a support group, you know, kind of going through it together. I think must must be helpful. That's a great link uh, that uh, Krista put up there. Thank you, Krista, for that. Uh, one more question, uh, Kathy. You mentioned the uh, kiosk, which of course is uh, a subject close to us, as we have been encouraging libraries to extend their physical presence out in the community using, you know, 
pop-up libraries, uh, these outlets, what we're now calling community access stations, uh, AKA kiosk in the, in the USAC language. Uh, but you mentioned using category two for kiosk and the formula of square footage. So what's the, what's the square footage of a kiosk that would have any relevance, you know, two no, in square? The, in the USAC, it's more the relevance of measuring it so that it's, if you're making a purchase that's category two eligible, if you're getting service there, I, I think you're fine. If you're, if you're gonna put a wireless access point there, then of course you wanna, you wanna have that listed on your application mm -hmm. and you wanna measure that square foot because libraries receive their funding by square foot. Well, wouldn't the service area be the uh, range of the Wi-Fi signal for the kiosk? No, I don't think so. I, I think it's somewhat, I think it's really the, the, the kiosk. Okay, last, last question. One more last question. Uh, any sense of how much fiber, how many libraries are, I mean, a big part of that cost of the data is driven by uh, replacing copper with fiber. Do you have any sense of how many libraries have fiber connections versus copper connections? I don't. Um, okay. I don't. Okay, that's, that's a tough one, I know. We've been advocating that, you know, since 2007 with ALA and, you know, the fastest way to get fiber next generation broadband, we called it, into every community was to run gigabit fiber to all 16,500 something libraries and also as a middle mile strategy. So anyway, kind of the beginning of, of uh, the Shelby conversation, mm -hmm. uh, which I will stop because we want to we want to get to Rebecca and uh, Rebecca, uh, you can Stop your screen share now, Kathy. Thank you very much. Uh, Rebecca, maybe you could pick up this uh, and pick up the E-rate part and then segue as we talked about into the other resources that you've been able to develop. And uh, tell us about your new job first. You, you, you've taken on new roles. Thank you, Don. Thanks for having me back, um, of course. So uh, the last time I was here, I was the Internet and Media Services. Nope, that wasn't my title. That was my title before uh, when I started at Cuyahoga County Public Library. Um, I was the Information and Technology Literacy Manager uh, when I was here last time. Um, and since Monday, I actually have moved into the role as the Director of our Programming Division, which is our Literacy and Learning Division. Um, so a lot of what I talk about today I will be around programs and how we're virtually engaging our communities uh, and showing value through that and how we use our funds to do that, uh, which will be a big part of my lead in here. Um, but I'm, I'm excited to be in this role. I've been a part of the division for the last uh, seven, almost eight years. I, over all programming that is either STEM makerspace or um, technology training focused. I, we like to say if it plugged in, it was a part of my previous department. Um, and now I'm over all of our programming um, as the director. And so really leading our vision um, for how we engage our audiences with programming. Um, so a little bit about the Cuyahoga County Public Library. We are the uh, library that serves the area, the suburban area around Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, we have 27 branches that serve 47 of the suburban communities in that area. Um, as Don noted early on, we are consistently one of the busiest and best libraries in the country. Uh, we just celebrated our 11th year at the top of library journals rankings of public libraries. Um, we are uh, incredibly grateful for that uh, and uh, it is an honor uh, for us to be there and also um, an honor that we don't take lightly uh, and we work very hard to uh, make sure that we can, you know, maintain that high quality of service uh, and of programming. Um, so uh, in terms of funding, uh, Ohio is an interesting state for that. You have, many of you probably know that we are the best funded state in the country for libraries. Um, and about half of our funding actually comes from the state itself. Uh, it is um, amazing that we get that kind of funding. It actually comes from local in income tax. We have what we call the PLF, which is the Public Library Fund in the state. Um, it, it is though uh, always scary because um, with those funds, especially in a year like 2020, and we know we have a state budget coming up in 2021, um, everyone knows that libraries are very well funded in Ohio. And so there's always that temptation to kind of chip away at that funding. 
Um, I mentioned, you know, about half of our funding comes from there. Uh, when uh, that fund was uh, chipped away at in a big way back in 2009, uh, we faced layoffs, um, we faced the chance of closures, uh, but our state representatives also noticed that they got an amazing amount of phone calls uh, from their constituents. Uh, and in fact, many of ours have stated that they will never try to do that again uh, because of the outcry <laughs> uh, for libraries and what it meant in Ohio. Um, while it is 50% of our budgets, it, there were libraries in Ohio that had never passed a local levy until that point, who had never sought funding outside of state funding. Um, and so for those, they were in a much dire situation than we were. But still for us, that was it's a big chunk of what we do. However, in addition to that, uh, we have local property taxes that fund us. Um, and I'm going to be talking about that a little bit more here in a minute. Um, and then we have a very healthy uh, grant pool that funds programming in particular and some of our services. Uh, that's something that we have really built since uh, 2009. And when we saw that first reduction in funding as we got nervous about uh, leaving too many eggs in our state's basket, uh, we really looked to control our own destiny a bit there. Um, and then we do get additional um, reimbursements through funds like E-Rate. Uh, E-Rate is definitely has been on our radar, uh, back when I worked in our IT division, um, I used to be one of our E-rate preparers. I have not done that, thankfully, since 2010. Um, it was challenging, especially for a system as large as we are. Uh, we have 27 different, uh, 24 different school districts that we serve. Um, and, and at the time, that made it very challenging for us. Um, you know, the other challenge, as mentioned by both Bob and, and Bob in the chat and Don, is that we do not filter um, content. And so what we could reach out to E-Rate uh, for reimbursement wasn't uh, as robust, maybe, as, as you know, what we would be able to if, if we'd chosen to go that route. Um, however, we, were, we are in a good situation in Ohio. Um, all Ohio libraries receive their uh, internet connectivity through the Ohio Public Library Information Network. Um, they're the backbone of connectivity in the state. Um, they also, uh, we also have a great state E-rate coordinator um, who's very knowledgeable and very helpful. Um, and then we have vendors who are really used to working with E-rate in the state. Um, and so we found all of those to be really positive um, for us as we pursued E-rate. Um, I know that we are in a position to use a consultant now who prepares our E-rate uh, applications for us. And we're very grateful for that. Um, and I also know that we got a little more than we were expecting this year, although I can't speak to uh, why that happened, but it was a good thing. And um, one of the things though, uh, we are fortunate that uh, in the last, um, the years since our, our first levy that I was involved with uh, at the library, which was in 2008, um, we have uh, run a, a massive capital campaign that has either renovated or built new all of our library branches except for one. And so we were able to really um, build in, you know, we have a very good sense of all of our square footage. We were able to build a lot of that knowledge into um, our buildings. Um, so it, moving on a little bit about showing value though, because I, I mentioned we passed the levy in 2008. Um, and that levy in particular for us was uh, built around taking control of all of our communities and the buildings in our communities. So prior to that time, each individual community um, owned their building and we leased that space from them. And then we had to depend on that community for, um, for the upkeep of the space, you know, for any improvements. If we wanted to build or renovate a building, we had to put a um, a ballot issue on in a particular community. And it was very inconsistent. And one of the things that we really uh, sought to do was be consistent across our branches. We may be suburban, but we serve some of the wealthiest communities in the area, but we also serve in our inner ring suburbs in particular, um, communities that see the same level of poverty as the inner city of Cleveland. Um, and so our ability to provide consistent service, consistent gigabit access across those spaces, uh, we do have fiber built out to all of our buildings, Don, you'll be happy to hear that. Um, but our, our ability to be consistent was really a part of that, um, 
of that ask in 2008. And we also, uh, we also had the lowest millage of any library system in the county for that. We can spread out across our communities. We absorbed all of those costs that each community was, was uh, paying at the time. And now everyone pays one consistent rate. Um, but because we can spread out throughout the distance, and, and I should note here that Cuyahoga is unusual in that we actually have nine library systems in the county, um, eight small systems, well, seven small systems in addition to ours, and then uh, the Cleveland Public Library is actually its own as well. Um, but we, of all of those uh, systems within the area, we have the lowest millage and we've continued to have the lowest millage. However, in uh, 2020, uh, we knew going into the year that uh, we were going to need to go back to the ballot. Uh, we had not been in 12 years. We'd done you know, an amazing job, but in those 12 years, uh, we had run a capital program. We'd seen lots of changes in funding um, from the state, uh, just in property taxes as a whole, and it was really time for us to go back. Um, so 2020 was really not the year that we wanted to go. We wanted to go in March if we had to go, um, and we did. We knew that. We talked to our board early on, um, but our county government, so we are not, while we are a county library, we are not, we are in a, a, an affiliate of county government. We are not run by the county government as a whole. We have our own board of um, trustees, our own directors, um, but the county government does appoint um, some of our boards, some of our trustees, uh, and also has quite a bit of say, um, really, in, in, in things like when we go to the ballot. Um, and they had a health and human services levy on in March and asked us to go in November. Um, so obviously, November of 2020 was not a time that you really want to be on the ballot. There was a couple other things going on um, that were very contentious. Uh, we didn't want to get pulled into that. Um, and also running a levy in a presidential election is much more expensive. Um, but <clears throat> we planned, we plowed ahead. Um, and then in March, there was a pandemic. And um, that changed, really changed everything for us. So we ended up going to the ballot in November and I, I won't, I'll spoil it now. We passed, um, <laughs> passed with our greatest, to our greatest extent, um, that we have before. I believe last in 28, in 2008, we passed by 57%. This time it was 60%. Um, so we were thrilled, but it was a very different campaign. Um, I have worked on several library campaigns and a community college campaign in my past. And um, this was incredibly different. We didn't buy TV ads uh, because with packs and super packs out there, you can spend a lot of money and still get preempted. It's just not worth spending it. Um, and so most of what we did was word of mouth, was good service, was making sure that we were out there um, and making sure, you know, we, we shared an awful lot of information from our personal uh, social media pages, from our library social media pages. Um, from any way we could, email blasts. You know, I worked, I'd never worked a text bank before, but it was a lot of fun. Um, happily for me, who is a, I am a confirmed introvert, um, I didn't have to work any phone banks, which was wonderful. <laughs> um, but, you know, we found other ways to get it out there. But what I want to talk about um, for my last few minutes here is really how we showed our value to our customers. Um, and it was doubly challenging because we were in the middle of a pandemic. Um, I, you know, I know Don knows the last time I was on, I was talking a bit about our challenges um, and our challenges reaching our customers. Um, and one of the statistics I used that time was that between when we closed abruptly in March and when we reopened to customer traffic at the beginning of July, uh, we logged 70,000 sessions from our uh, parking lots on our Wi Fi. And it is both a number that is astounding and a number that's horrifying to us because that means that there were customers sitting in our parking lot who didn't have access in another way. Um, and so uh, when we reopened on July 6th, we reopened for computer use, we reopened for um, you know, materials pickup. Uh, we actually reopened for materials pickup at the beginning of June, um, but we let customers back into our branches on July 6th. 
Uh, we did not resume programming in person though. And so that meant that we really needed to continue to show our value to our customers and reach them in any way we could. And we did that by quickly ramping up virtual programs. Um, so we did things like author visits. Um, in the end of 2020, from about uh, April 2020 on, we had over 70 virtual author visits. Um, we, in 2029, had 110 author visits. We quickly become a hub. Um, I have I, one of my managers within my area is uh, spends a good portion of his time scheduling authors. The publishers know him. Um, we become a place for authors to come, and uh, especially when they're on a book tour, uh, talk about their book and talk about how they love libraries, usually, because it's rare to find an author who doesn't. Um, we had great attendance. Those 2019 numbers are in person. The 2020 numbers, though, are from a mix of um, Zoom, of a platform called Crowdcast, uh, and Facebook Live events. And as soon as we ramped up, we, um, we started quickly booking authors. And in fact, we found that we can get some bigger name authors, um, authors from, you know, from other continents who never would have been flown to the US and probably wouldn't have stopped in Cleveland, Ohio, um, but can happily be a part of our programming uh, virtually. We are booked currently through uh, April of this year and we're running three, uh, at least three author events a, a week at this point. So it's pretty amazing and pretty amazing content. Um, we also, you know, needed to get back out there and do what libraries do. Um, and one of those things was story time. Our children's librarians were just, I mean, literally emailing and calling us um, to say, can I get out there? Can I do something? Can I please, can I film this? And some of them were filming their own story times on their own social media pages um, when they could, because they were so just anxious to get out there and reconnect with their kids. Um, since then, we found a, a great way to do it, to put it up on Facebook. Uh, we do Facebook Live events. Um, we're also starting Zoom story times in the next few weeks here. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about our staff preparation and how we got our staff, um, aside from our very eager staff, how we got the rest of the staff on board and ready to go. Um, we did uh, 36 STEAM programs throughout the fall this year. They were all virtual. Um, that includes a five session coding program where we gave the kids Arduinos and uh, some plants. Um, and, and really for us, I think one of the amazing things is that particular session, five sessions, we would have had a hard time getting kids to continuously come to five sessions in person, but we kept all 19 kids in that program and even kept all 19 kids through a two week holiday break, they all came back in January. So I, I think we saw some real engagement that we wouldn't have expected before. Um, we also did virtual summer reading and virtual STEAM challenges. And then, let's see, uh, we did a virtual youth engagement. So I mentioned earlier that we have a robust grant fund. Um, and one of the things that our grants have funded are some programs like uh, those that you see here, which are virtual baby club. Um, this is, I believe up in the top left, there's a virtual tour of our memory spaces, which is one of our maker spaces. Um, but we run things like a kindergarten club for our children who haven't been in organized care. Um, they, it gets them ready for kindergarten. And some of the things, things like being able to sit crisscross applesauce or stand in a line or raise their hands. Um, it also works with their parents uh, to build confidence um, and some comfort around what their kids will be learning. Um, and then we also have a, what we call a baby club where we work with parents um, and help them build some connections to other parents and build literacy skills. Uh, those kept going. Um, they weren't quite as successful in building those relationships uh, were, was challenging, but it was a great opportunity for us. Um, and then in these last couple of slides, I, I also, uh, my previous uh, portion of our, my division now um, ran technology training. And technology training was the, one of the few, technology training and career counseling were two of the few programs that we brought back um, in person initially. But really what we found was that we had very inconsistent customer attendance in person. We would have a full program in one place or one week and then get two or none the following week. And so we actually switched to virtual in September 
Um, we have been all virtual since we had to close our doors uh, to the public again in November. Uh, since the middle of November, we've been curbside, um, pro curbside and uh, drive-through um, service to our customers. And then we've been all virtual programs too. Um, but we really ramped up our virtual sessions. And I think an interesting thing in, in 2020 and the years before, good numbers, a good average for my trainers to see in a month was about 10 people per class. And right now we're averaging 32 people per class in our virtual sessions. Um, and so we're not only able to serve more people with those sessions and hit some additional topics, but we also um, are able really to, uh, you know, to hit more people that we didn't know we had. And then finally, because Don, I know you're going to tell me it's time. Um, <laughs> coming in 2021, we have more authors, uh, more staff led programming. We've spent the fall, my division has spent the fall um, prepping all of our degree librarians to go out and run virtual programs. We have come up with best practices. We've done Zoom training sessions. Um, and I am going to release them next week to go and share with all of their colleagues and plan virtual programming for you know, the foreseeable future to come. We do not see in-person programming until at least this fall. And even then, I think we have seen such benefit from, from um, being able to provide this content virtually and such an opening um, to audiences that we haven't engaged before that we will continue this in some form. We certainly are excited to get our customers back in and to learn with them in person too. Um, but we definitely see an opportunity for us to be able to just expand our audience and expand the way that we engage them. So thank you. Great, terrific, Rebecca. Well, we're, we're gonna run over a few minutes. We're not uh, strictly, this is not like a time slot on a TV uh, program. So um, uh, Rose asked if you can share your slide deck. Do you have a link? That would be great. We can post a link on the GLN website for this. For, sure. I mean, the, I'll, get a, I'll get a link to you. Okay, that's great. We'll do that. Um, how the, the, your your training numbers are really impressive, uh, and and you make the point that we've heard, you know, from a lot of different sources about, you know, this kind of next normal. Uh, yeah. You know, we're not going back. We've discovering new things. Uh, this, you know, virtualization or digitalization was already, you know, accelerating before the pandemic, and now, it, you know, put it into, you know, hyperdrive, and so we're learning things, uh, and we're wondering, you know, it, are there better ways to do things as a result of that? You've given a really good example of it, uh, but but a question about support of people, you know. Yeah. computer support for people how how do you do that how you know a new user do you screen share or right. how do you help people that, so, you know you look over the shoulder in the classroom one of the areas that really pains me i, I mean I, I clearly talked a bit about my career with cuyahoga county public library but i've been involved in digital in uh, equity uh, work in the area for well for the full 20 years of my library career and um one of the things that still really concerns me is that we are hitting our customers who are connected. Um, you know, we may provide hotspots to customers, but it's not the same. Um, this past week was the first week that we tried some basics classes um, in our virtual classes, and, and they went pretty well. Um, but we are fully aware that we're going to continue. Um, we're going to continue to miss some of our audience. Um, until we really get back. I, I think our plan moving forward is really gonna be that we will offer our more advanced topics virtually as when we can get our customers back in. And then we will really move um, towards featuring our basics classes in person. Um, one of the things that we've never done as a system either is uh, lend devices. So that is something that we just, it, it was more trouble than it was worth to us. We have so much um, access in our branches uh, that that was, you know, that was always the way that we engaged our customers and they were, they've always been willing to come into us too. Um, but obviously, you know, th that presented a challenge when we couldn't be open to customers. Um, starting next week, we actually will be lending um, 
uh, laptops to customers too, who uh, just for use in the parking lots. Um, I should mention, I, I did not mention in my presentation, but we have uh, throughout the fall outfitted all of our branches with additional uh, antennas so that we can um, drift our Wi-Fi signal out uh, more uh, in more consistent fashion into our parking lots and then also to any green spaces around. Uh, and we have several um, uh, projects in place with both our county and some of our municipalities uh, to, to move it even further uh, into locations around our branches. Um, but we're gonna start lending laptops where we can. Um, you know, our staff are amazing about walking customers through whatever they need to walk through. Um, it's obviously easier in person, uh, but they will do it over the phone as well. Um, and then I will say the other piece of our virtual programming that we've been very consistent on um, and pretty emphatic about uh, from my division is that we have two people. Uh, we have a presenter for all programs and then there is someone else who is both handling the tech side of things, um, helping people get on if they have challenges and then answering all the questions. And so that way, if someone needs assistance, um, and especially in those more basic classes, we had lots of customers who needed assistance. Um, we've got somebody who's targeted to that and targeted to their needs, but then um, the person who's doing the presentation can really focus on presenting whatever it is that they're covering. That makes perfect sense. Uh, you don't want to interrupt the class, you know, to deal right. with it. Uh, what, what have been the, uh, the uses uh, uh, for your new users? What what have they mostly, can you generalize about the things that they wanted to do? You know, connect to their granddaughter, take a class, fill out a form. Is there any general rule? Uh, very much fill out a form, look for a job. You know, benefits are online. Um, and, and really, I, you know, a big part of what's driving, um, I, I didn't mention in here, but we've outfitted uh, in each branch, there's at least one um, meeting room that has, or study room that has a large screen um, and you know the ability to connect so that when our customers come back and they have virtual um, health visits, they can come in if they don't have access at home and do that with us. Um, I, I mean, we know virtual health isn't going away. A, a lot of people are you know, struggling to connect to their doctors right now. Um, we, have, we have some pretty amazing world-class class healthcare in the Cleveland clinic, clinic um, in our backyard. Um, but that also is, you know, it takes some connectivity uh, to engage, but you can get your health record online. Um, there's some pretty amazing statistics around uh, how, how, um, how people do when they are connecting with their health record online, they're less likely to go back into the hospital. They're more likely to keep up um, with their health conditions. And so we really see that kind of health literacy, digital literacy is a piece of health literacy. And that's one of our goals. And our customers do often come to us for health and wellness programming. I can so understand that. I mean, we, we, we just stop doctor's appointments all together right. for, for months and months. And so uh, for my, from my perspective, the, the providers have done a great job of developing simple interfaces. You know, they still have to deal with security issues and privacy issues, but they've had to make it pretty easy for almost anybody to be able to connect and have, a, you know, an interview. Uh, do you create a special space for these kinds of sessions, you know, like a little health closet booth or something like that, or just Give them some so space. we have um, many of our study rooms are, are semi-private. We still need to be able to see what goes on in it. Um, teens, after school, things like that can be challenging otherwise. Um, but they're semi-private and we've you know created a monitor. I, I am curious. I, I don't think that we fully explored um, the needs that some customers may have when it comes to their health visit uh, and the challenges that that will present, I'll just say that. Uh, but I, I do think that, that we wanted to get the access out there sooner rather than later. Right, it's important. When you're, and you're so right about forms, I mean, you can't apply for a yeah. job at McDonald's unless you go online. And uh, so, you know, we're all there. That's been the, 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 the new realization is this is an absolutely essential capability that everybody has to have. One of the cases that, that we've been making for 
support for the library is this whole virtualization of uh, especially especially of government services public information and 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 government e-government in a word uh and that it's one thing for amazon to offer services to people that are connected it's a very different proposition for the public sector to only offer services to people that are connected right. you know the the wino plays a high percentage of taxes right she deserves access to all this stuff so when you approach them, well, what about people don't have it? And they go, oh, oh, well, uh, they can go to the library. They'll help you. Yeah. Well, yeah, they will. But did you share any of the cost savings uh, from automating with the library? Maybe not. But we're just saying it's an argument to make with the public, uh, your public friends uh, or or employers uh, about about uh, about that and that they should. Um, we make a little progress with that argument, but some are immune to it, I find. Um, any last questions for Rebecca? We're going to we're going to close here. We're running a little over, but it's just been great. Just packed session with so much good stuff uh, from both of you. Uh, Kathy, you have a you have a word, a last word. Plan and file your e-rate applications, make use of that category two budget if you can. OK, great. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, very good. Uh, Rebecca, what what do you uh, you you seem really optimistic about uh, <laughs> the straits that we're in that, that, you know, you have to be considered an optimist. So what do you see in this year? How how do you think things are going to change? How back to normal or new normal do you think we're going to get Rebecca before, you know, we're in any kind of a stable state or, you know, what do you see happening this year other than your, your program intentions? What's your predictions? Well, my staff will tell you, John, that I am relentlessly optimistic. Um, and I kind of hold that as a badge of honor. Um, it's not unrealistic, but I, I do try to be optimistic. Um, you know, I think we, I think I'm optimistic because we learned a lot from last year. Um, and everything, every program that we had planned for last summer that we had to scrap has helped inform the way that we plan moving forward. And so I really see as, as hard as it was to, you know, to walk away from some amazing things we had planned, especially for the summer of 2020, um, our ability to take that, to take what we learned, um, and implement it. Uh, it we've, we've done an amazing job so far. And I mean, as a system, the first time we closed, we struggled to reopen for curbside and for, um, for drive-through pickup. And when we were, when our numbers forced us to close again in November, we not only reopened with that immediately, but we had programs out there that we switched um, to virtual, we had programs out there that were already going. We had, you know, we were able to, um, now when we're closed, we still can have customers call and give us, um, send us a file that they need to print and we'll bring it out to them. You know, it's really changed. And, and I think that we continue to do that as we see a need, like for computers, we continue to evolve. We may never have loaned devices before, but we're going to start on Monday. Um, and I think, you know, I think that's what libraries do. And so, yeah, I, I know it's, it's been a hard year for everybody, um, but we've really been able to, um, to live some of those challenges. Many of us have kids at home. You know, I have a kindergartner who started kindergarten um, virtually, which was weird. Um, and, you know, I've seen her go back to school, but I can really empathize with those parents in our kindergarten clubs. And so I think that we, you know, we're all just taking what we've learned and we're helping our customers with it. And, and I am optimistic because we have this amazing staff that would rather be in our buildings and engaging our customers any way they can um, than, you know, than not, than be home. Um, and so I, I think you're going to see libraries continue to meet the challenge. We're tired. Everybody's tired, um, but but we're going to continue to to do what we do best and try to provide information and try to connect people to the information that's out there. Fabulous, that's great. I, I, you make a rational case for optimism. That's what I would. That's how I would describe it. And you know, contrary wise, it's easy. There's so much evidence, you know, to support pessimism. 
you know, but what's the point? You want to avoid disappointment, being right about everything being terrible. Uh, I think it just leads to cynicism. And, and it's so much about attitude, what, what we're able to accomplish and do. And I would just add that what you're talking about, there's a, there's a meta layer of that, not just, the, not just the coping that you've done in this really stressful year, but the ability to do that that you can take on a major challenge and, 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 and rise up to it. That to me is, you know, there are going to be others that are not pandemic oriented. And, and we pointed out to some early on in the program. So having some confidence to deal with things, I, what could be more valuable and having a great team. I know you guys do, you're recognized for it, you know, 11 years running. Um, so everybody, I think you, you just did a, a great uh, uh, a job of telling the story and, and how you managed and, you know, programs and support. And I thank you and, and Kathy both. We've, we've had an excellent session. This will be uh, up on uh, Monday uh, for re later viewing. And I'll look for your link on your slides, Rebecca. And we will look forward to having you both back at a future time to see how things are continuing to unfold and, and what changes have happened. So I'm hey, gonna- Don, stop. how about a check? Check, uh, oh, clap. Hey, everybody, everybody, please uh, unmute. Unmute everybody. I don't have global unmute. Everybody unmute. We're gonna give our speakers a round of applause, please. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you guys. It was awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, great, great. Okay, I'm stopping the recording now. Thank you.